uh, Amadullah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session. Um, and uh, before I introduce um, Buddha Ditya, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Amadullah Bai on building up such a um, such a wonderful uh, series of talks um, over such a long period of time. Um, so I think he ought to feel quite happy, or very happy, really, with the way things are are, are going to bring a whole variety of voices um, rather than just the usual ones. Um, uh, so I just want to introduce um, Buddha Ditya. Um, uh, we met four years ago at, um, at SOAS, London University, and uh, explored mutual interests. My first research was done in Calcutta back in 1970, 1971, and uh, kept a, a, a strong link with uh, that um, amazing city. Uh, and of course, he's very much involved in that city, but also he is now doing a PhD at Durham. So he spans the, uh, the, the links between Britain and, and India. Um, uh, and also he works across uh, a, a wide range of uh, academic interests, uh, disciplines, uh, but also he's, uh, he's a musician, musician himself uh, and a singer. And so he's a man of many parts. So um, I won't, I'll hand over to him now. We've got um, uh, till, uh, we've got a, a, an hour and three quarters. So we've got lots of time um, to listen to both to him, but also to exchange ideas. So uh, over to you, Buddha Ditya. Oh, by the way, just mute usual thing and use the chats uh, for questions. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, John. Um, at the very outset, and I'll have to um, thank you because if it were not for your very kind help, I would have wouldn't have been able to uh, conceive this project in the first place. Because I remember um, coming across a Shadinata Trust leaflet at the British Library, and then thinking of uh, dropping a random email, and so it, you happened to be my first port of entry to my master's and, and then which led to my PhD. So uh, first things first, and now uh, I'll, I'll start cooking. Uh, but before that, I need to share, share my screen. Uh, I hope it's uh, visible. Uh, I'll just go full screen, um, sorry. Yeah. Somewhere in Bangla town, spread in and around East, Len East London's Brick Lane, as a vehicle rooms pass to recede in the distance, floating Bengali tunes reach Peter Cusack's sound recorder. Shana is Rahmatullah's famous Deshatta Bodak patriotic hit, Akbar Jete Dena Amat Chotto Shonar Gaye. For once, please let me go to my tiny golden village is being played at a shop, maybe a restaurant or retail outlets like the now closed Shongita Glamour International or the joint video and takeaway shop that you see in the slide. All of them selling sounds, videos and tunes from across South Asia. Amidst this sonic concoction, individual ingredients can be identified too. Prayers from the Jami Masjid in the vicinity, the clacking of cutlery, Interim silences, followed by minces of friends' street conversations. Minces like in Sileti, Kamzedin Balalagle, E Dukanegele, followed by bouts of laughter. Beneath these layers of sound would be other layers too, worlds in their own right, chefs and cooks chopping, slicing, frying, waiters serving, managers overseeing in house activity going about their business, most of whom initially migrated from the eastern part of geographical Bengal, specifically Silet in present-day Bangladesh. Uh, before proceeding further, 
with this gastromusicological endeavor, and I say gastromusicological in, in quotes. Um, I'll, I'll, and but by the way, it's not my uh, neologism, so yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a brief history of Bengali's restaurant trade in Britain. As Rosina Vistram points out, both in Asians in Britain, 400 years of history, and Ayas, Laskars, and Princes, the history of Bengali run and Pan Asian restaurant trade in Britain traces back to the 1800s onwards with the setting up of cafes alongside the lodging houses around the docks catering to the sailors. Deedan Muhammad, a Bengali Muslim hailing from Patna in the then Bengal presidency, writes to his imaginary friend in his travelogue, uh, The Travels of Deedan Muhammad, about the Hindustani coffee house established in 1810 at 34 George Street, Portman Square, London, furnished with Asiatic embellishments according to the Epicure's almanac or calendar of good living. High-end restaurants like Veera Swami's in London's Regent Street, uh, still very much in business, gradually became a part of the metropolis's dining culture. Nurul Islam, in his 1989 published Prabhashir Katha, Tales of Immigrants, notes the presence of 20, around 20 Indian, Indian restaurants by the end of the Second World War. However, Combing through several sources, including Kelly's Post Office Directory, the Post Office London Trades Directory, and the Post Office London Street Directory, local historian, lyricist, and ex-restorator Farooq Ahmed, in his recently published book, Bilate Bangali Ovibashan, suggests the presence of at least 70 Indian restaurants and 50 cafes in London by 1946 more than 26 of which would be owned by Bengali settlers. Shah Abdul Mojid Qureshi, alias Moina Mia, arriving in London in 1936 as a seaman, opened the Dilkosh restaurant two years later. However, Ahmed has traced the establishment of probably the first silly owned restaurant in Britain, Alauddin restaurant in 1935, which closed down the same year Dilkosh opened. And Ali's cafe, to be the first Sileti owned cafe in Britain, opened by Tajafur Ali at 27 Victoria Dock Road, London E16. I'll come back to Farouk Ahmed's, Farouk Ahmed's personal experiences later. Excavating strands of music from sonic, sonic scapes of these early Indian restaurants are expectedly challenging. Even more so is to produce a nuanced political narrative of Bengali musical sensibilities. However, given the hefty funds that were invested in projects like Deen Muhammad's Hindustani Coffee House to lend an exoticized appeal, it is unlikely that attention would not have been paid to its sonic decor. Unfortunately, I have not traced any historical record to confirm it yet, fingers crossed. Um, throughout that century, the 19th century, inventions in the age of modernity gifted the world with new technologies. One of the most significant towards the end of it being the invention of audio recording. Public and private spaces alike, listening technologies signified novel ways of sounding self-representation and celebrating personal and familial identity constructs. In 1927, almost a decade and a half later, when musicians of the likes of Gohad Jan were enjoying celebrity status, partly also because of their record selling like hot cakes in the Indian subcontinent. Cubicles in the audition room of a gramophone shop in London were still more entertaining, more, more entertaining for the leisured passerby than the telephone boxes, as the Daily Mail London report, this da Daily Mail London report suggests. However, it can only be speculated where the tunes of that Bengali humorous music would have also been procured by those others visiting the shop, occasionally to be played at the already existing Bengali run Indian restaurants, some of them also serving the high brows. As a brief excursion, what does not need speculation is whether songs in Bengali ever made it to the elite restaurant serving British fare meant for the high pros. Roughly around the same time when Sileti Bengalis, especially from Molubi Bajar, were settling in London, setting up restaurant business in the late 1930s and through the next two decades, Bina Addo, who would spell uh, Bina Adi, I mean, was the uh, 
it, it, this this used to be I mean how most upper class elite Bengalis used to spell their names in a in a anglicized manner. Uh, Bina Adro, a globe-trotting mezzo-contralto singing star, born to a Bengali Christian family in Calcutta, now Kolkata, was performing songs of Rabindranath Thakur to members of Derby Women's Luncheon Club at the St. James's restaurant in Derby, in the north of England, not very far from Durham, actually, um, in 1939, which made news in the Derby te Daily Telegraph dubbed the only Indian woman of pro professional standing to sing abroad by the Radio Times, Addo was not only popular for her renditions of Tego's songs, but also for her operatic collaborations, as reported in a feature among women music performers on the front page of the Covent Herald. Uh, by the way, I just want to go back. Uh, so this is uh, on, on to the right of your screens. Uh, you can see an excerpt uh, which I, by chance, um, stumbled upon um, at, while while reading through some issues of the of the Provashi Potrika at the British Library, and I wasn't expecting this at all. So this was quite a um, jubilant moment. Uh, and yeah, I mean, not only the Provashi. I mean, uh, there are similar. Uh, reports of, of musical activities of the Bengali diaspora um, published in numerous other Bengali dailies based in uh, based in Calcutta. I mean, obviously, Prabhashi was first based in uh, based out of Allahabad, but nevertheless. So uh, yeah, unexpected, but but uh, it, it's good to find all these kinds of uh, informations. Uh, moving on. Um, coincidentally, it was in Coventry where goods stolen on January the 15th, 1965 from the modern restaurant Hillfields were reported in the Coventry Evening Telegraph to be found in a sack on the doorstep at 6 p.m. Among the stolen and returned items contained a tape recorder, knives, four records of Indian music, Indian music, and a tape recorder. Whether run by Bengalis or not, it is indisputable that the auditory has been crucial for um, restaurateurs towards curating the Indian curry, the Indian curry experience, experience in restaurants across Britain. The auditory would be a part of what sociologist Philip Kotler would call atmospherics. Later on, Alvaro Kotler's empirical term atmospherics, which comprises elements such as brightness, size, shape, volume, pitch, scent, freshness, softness, smoothness, and temperatures, especially smoothness, quite a lot. Um, in a historical affective sense. Uh, in this context, I also borrow from sociologist Tia Dinora's work to flesh out a historical understanding of the role of audio environment, particularly, particularly music to understand Bengali run restaurants as historical bodies of sound and music. For the same, I draw from two of my interlocutors based in Enfield and Oldham, respectively. Local historian and ex-restorator Farooq Ahmed, as I mentioned uh, towards the beginning of my presentation, and um, ex-cook and poet come composer Yusuf Mia, based in Oldham near Manchester, to listen to how different musics have played a role in creating scenic and sonic, scenic and sonic specificity of a predominantly Indian a pan subcontinental identity besides simultaneously sustaining Bengali genealogical sonic intimacies behind the counters at these restaurants. Um, I like to call my interlocutors uh, friends and here I must express um, gratitude to uh, music researcher Moshumi Bhomik for continuing to teach me this quality. I don't know if Moshumi is here but nevertheless uh, this is a big thing I keep learning from her how to uh, mold uh, friendships and not just uh, treat fellow people as um, interlocutors just meant to do the PhD and do kind of parachute research and leave. So that's a big learning. Um, <clears throat> Farooq Ahmed, or Farooq Shahib as I call him, came to the United Kingdom in 1989 as a lyricist on tour settling in this country to write local histories of Desh home and Bidesh away parallelly working in the restaurant trade 
later on acquiring a stake in the Bengal Bertie's restaurant once located in Archville, North London. Bengal Bertie's has since changed ownership to another Bengali, now called the Bombay Rickshaw. As someone whom I meet regularly, beyond the need for my doctoral research, I will inadvertently fall back upon the transcripts of, of my memory, besides obviously referring to material from recorded informal uh, freewheeling chats. Um, I'm not fond of, call, of, uh, of the formal connotations to interviews, um, a setting which constipates, I believe constipates the flow of the conversation, the, the rush, the rush. Unfortunately, Farooq Shaib is at work now um, and, and thus he's unable to um, speak out his memory. So you know, you'll have to bear with me. Um, so um, this, is a, this is a translated excerpt of a freewheeling conversation that we, we were having on the, on the 5th of October, um, more than a year ago now. So what he was telling me now, and now I'll leave my, my script for a moment and uh, um, so what, what he would tell me is, um, and he keeps on telling me, is uh, whenever people, the staff used to uh, open shop, uh, most of them would feel that something's missing if the, if the music is, is not being played. And before lunch hours, um, what Farooq Shab recalls is uh, they would play mostly Polligiti. Uh, and 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 what he would what he says as uh, Marty Shur uh, tunes uh, of the land uh, things like um, composers like the great Radha Ramon um, Kari Amiruddin and Manik Mia's uh, flute album Prabashi Bangla Bashi. Of course, I think Moshu Midi has got a copy and and she she got to know in one of the interviews um, that she was conducting back in two thousand seven or eight and that's um, deposited at the British Library. Um, and it's worth a, worth a listen, um, especially, I mean, for, of course, only for those who speak, speak Bangla. Um, um, and, and he further went on to mention, uh, however, we often changed when customers would arrive, um, to, tuning into kinds of mellow, mellow instrumental music uh, of the likes of, uh, of Ravi Shankar or Jagjit Singh or or any, any other kinds of um, instrumental music, uh, kind of soft uh, pop um, that would have kind of a Indian exoticized, um, exoticized flavor. Um, so uh, here, of course, um, I'm trying to think how, how people, uh, Bengalis in the, in the British diaspora, they were um, consciously curating uh, sonic specificities in order to um, appeal to a specific class of uh, people and, and specific group of um, customers. Uh, now, since this is located in quite a posh area of London, um, Archway, that, that area specifically, um, here, this, uh, I mean, the restaurant owners uh, would like to appeal uh, to that kind of people uh, who would have certain expectations, certain hearing, hearing expectations. Now I've kept the second, the next um, piece of um, conversation uh, as a contrast. Uh, for, before that, a bit about um, Yusuf Mia. So Yusuf Mia happens to be the, the son of the late uh, Ishkandar Mia, who used to be a great, uh, Baul composer, and he also uh, fought and composed songs um, for the for, for the seventy one movement based out of Oldham, and they would go to Trafalgar Square um, uh, and and all across all over the UK to uh, raise funds. Um, and Yusuf Mia has also gotten some of his father's qualities. He writes, um, he composes, uh, but he says he doesn't sing very often. And um, but he has been he he was um, involved with the with the restaurant trade, and he came to the UK in 1986 uh, to join his his parents. So um, he has, as you can see, uh, he he worked all all over Britain. Croydon in South London, Brighton, nearby Cheatham Hill. And um, he said 
while and it was quite a, a humorous conversation to be honest because uh, he said that some english customers could not relate to the tunes of moromi gun that he he would uh, he could not help but break into and he said that um shur ashe in bangla which would say the tunes um, automatically spurt out um and and they would they would call for the for the chef um and and ask what was wrong with him and why he was wailing uh, and crying because he was singing all these kinds of moromi uh, gun and and the takeaways also had bollywood and and bangla music videos uh, being played on 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 indian as well as as well as bangladeshi um, channels uh, so here um I'm trying to look into a different, um, as Pierre Baudet would say, habitus, uh, into a different habitus, because here the, the clientele would be a bit different. Obviously, the, the prices are low, much low. Uh, uh, different kind of people would come. Uh, and, and here, so in a sense, I'm trying to hypothesize uh, um, and flesh out a discourse that people uh, might be more free in terms of um expressing themselves uh, when they were still uh, still open so um here the the public and the private space within the restaurants they were much uh, much more fuzzy so um this is what i mean by um curating um sonic specificities um like curating a kind of a sonic experience which would um, append to a kind of uh, people that they, they would like to serve and, and get on with brisk business. Okay, so now this is quite a curious case. Um, so this Monday, um, I, I went to um, Farooq Shaib's uh, home uh, in uh, residence in, in Enfield. And we have been uh, and uh, talking about this case uh, for, for quite a while now, and and I prodded him like if it would be possible to um, look out for some documents relating to uh, some letters that he had received from the um, public uh, from the from the Performing Rights Society for Music, the PRS uh, Music, uh, regarding uh, having not paid um, copyrights and. Uh, so so uh, we we went and uh, on the on the right of your screens you can see him uh, uh, looking out for those documents in the in the warehouse of the restaurant the the Bombay Bertie's now what is now what is what is uh, Bombay Rickshaw and um, to my delight uh, we could find and it's due to painstaking efforts of Farooq Shah, we have actually located the documents which are now with me. So I'll, I'll um, scan them. But um, it is even more, more curious because um, this uh, phenomena of um, the PRS music sending um, slips of, of violations and, and warnings to Bengali restaurant owners um, is apparently not new. And um, this started, uh, probably, and this is the first case that I've been able to uh, dig into, and, and I'll get in touch uh, with PRS and look into their archives uh, if they have had issued any further um, warnings or any kinds of, um, had, had kind of any kind of, uh, issued any kind of fines. So uh, the Litchfield Mercury, uh, it had a, um, a piece on this, a, a small, uh, a small mention that uh, Shapla Tonduri, uh, a restaurant, and obviously you can understand it's a Bengali restaurant uh, because of the name, uh, that they had, uh, they had, they had issued similar kind of, uh, I mean, fines, because um, apparently uh, they were not paying uh, the license and the and the restaurant owners and the people, the staff related to the restaurant, they were listening to the radio, the restaurant without paying the paying the uh, uh, royalty. Uh, now for context, um, the British Music Copyright Collective uh, and, the, and, and the PRS, uh, the Phonographic Performance Limited along with the uh, Performing Rights Society, 
they, according to the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988, they can issue uh, such fines if people are even listening to radio uh, within public, uh, private spaces, not not meant for the for the customers. But this is a different matter altogether, because they were actually trying to charge fines for music that itself was not copyrighted. So they would listen to uh, the most, many of these restaurants would play uh, musics uh, like kind of Kari Amiruddin or kind of um, Manik Mia. And, and these were not copyrighted music. So they were essentially drawing uh, copyright fees uh, for musics which were not copyrighted. And, and as a result, the, which would not roll back to the pockets of the of the musicians who had performed. So this is quite a unique thing. And as a result, um, this owner of the Shapla Tonduri uh, and one of the partners, Mr. Habibur Rahman, he actually lodged a case. And to his uh, fury, uh, the court uh, didn't carry a favor. And now this is where I'm trying to look into the documents. I've, I've stumbled upon some, but I'll, I'll do further archival work and uh, further detective work. And here in this context, I must mention uh, the names, two names of my friends, uh, Shudipto Mitro and Migankum Kubadde, both of them historians uh, for, um, for emphasizing the need to carry out such micro histories, uh, micro history, um, adventures, to be honest, because um, that helps to give a really great um, overview of society in, in general. Now, coming back to um, Farooq Shaib uh, in 2010. So what happened is he reverted back to the to the PRS, like, this is not fine. Uh, what you're doing is not okay. And this was the uh, invoice that sent in 2010 when Bengal Berties was still in business uh, and the total was 301 pounds so here you can see 300 oh, probably not. here you can see 301 pounds and he, he actually sent a list of all the music albums that they were playing uh, in the restaurant uh, most of them uncopyrighted not copyrighted as I said and um, this time they couldn't do anything. So this investigation went on and um, I'll, I'm again investigating into this case uh, and I will get to the PRS. And since this is a really I mean, uh, new research happening, uh, fresh research, I haven't been able to advance much further, but I'll do in the, uh, in the coming days. So this was, um, the letter that we could find uh, from the, as you can see, uh, from the warehouse, which said, um, Kerry Stanley, the music licensing advisor, PRS for Music, he wrote, a, wrote, wrote back to Mr. Ahmed, um, saying that all these fines, uh, on all these fines that they were levying, they were all um, taken off. So that was a victory for uh, Mr. Ahmed and probably it reflects um, how, members of the Bengali diaspora, they were um, fighting for their, for their rights in, in different manners and music happened to be a really important, uh, although apparently, um, apparently less visible and less obvious um, thing. Right. Um, the, I'll again start reading a bit. Um, the steady proliferation of um, Indian restaurants, Indian restaurants, especially starting from the 1960s, um, dominated by Bengalis from Silet, happened in the backdrop of an increasing penetration of new cultural imports in the transatlantic, including Britain, uh, in, in, in the transatlantic public imagination. Uh, and that was the sitar. Uh, Ravi Shankar famously labeled this as the great sitar explosion in his autobiography, uh, Ragmala. Oliver Krask, uh, in his 2020 published biography of uh, Ravi Shankar, The Indian Sun, uh, draws from Douglas Knight's suggestion in Bala Saraswati, her art and life, the, the, Bharatanatim, the great Bharatanatyam dancer Bala Saraswati, that the 1963 Edinburgh International Festival proved to be a landmark in the 
growing popularity of Indian music in Britain. Um, Robi Shankar, Ali Akbar Khan, um, by the way, I think you can see a, a photo of um, a young, relatively young Ali Akbar Khan along with uh, uh, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan along with Guru Gyan Prakash Kosh uh, on, the, on the left. So yeah, anyways, coming back to the point. Um, and, and all these people, uh, Ravi Shankar, Ali Akbar Khan, Allah Rakha, MS Shruva Lakshmi and the Bharatanatyam dancer, Bala Saraswati were the, were the final performers. Uh, Bismillah Khan was supposed to uh, perform, but he couldn't make it uh, till the end. Um, by the mid uh, 1960s, uh, the Beatles had become a cultural phenomenon, constantly topping the charts. Uh, Norwegian Wood, um, one of the songs in the rub album Rubber Soul, uh, where the first use the twang of the sitar became a hit and the heightening craze for further exotic, exotic, exoticized Indian sounds amongst both uh, producers and consumers of pop as um, Daniel Neiman would say, comprising the ecology of Hindustani music. Um, saw similar collaborations with the Rolling Stones uh, following the Beatles. Now here's something uh, what I want to focus is uh, on, um, on, on the sitar as a, as, uh, an icon in, in the restaurant trade, um, in restaurant iconography. So on to the left, you can see, uh, uh, and we are not sure if uh, this is a Bengali restaurant, but most probably Bengali because um, I've read some um, advertisement features of the Star restaurant and it looks, it is Bengali, but I'll have to verify further. I mean, most probably it is, it is a Bengali, it has been a Bengali run restaurant. I can see uh, the sitar used as the logo, um, thus, thus representing, uh, thus representing the the auditory and the and the gastronomic uh, entwinement, gastronomic um, yeah entwining of of these uh, these kinds of tropes, um, and this is a Bengali restaurant uh, which you can see in the middle, the Golden Curry Indian restaurant, and I've kept here because. Uh, it says uh, their specialities are um, Indian, English, Bengali, and continental. So it's not exactly very, very precise and very specific. And yet they are able to uh, get the diners and authentic music atmosphere. So uh, this becomes very, really problematic and, and fuzzy because uh, when and these kinds of notions of authenticity, the they need really need to be um, problematized, problematized, because uh, uh, we really uh, don't know what they were meaning by um, uh, an authentic music uh, atmosphere. So, what was actually the uh, the Indian uh, restaurant music sound? Uh, on to your right, uh, you can see the Golden Bengal uh, Tandoori Restaurant, uh, and that's actually it was in Newcastle, and it's quite funny because. Um, if uh, one is able to develop uh, a historian's eye, uh, which I haven't been, I'm, I'm in the process, uh, but you can obviously um, look into these uh, spellings to understand the sounds and the, and the, and the music involved. Um, and it says uh, evening out in oriental atmosphere with music by uh, Ravi Shankar. So you can, I have pointed out the arrow because it is, no other than a Bengali person, uh, I mean, advertising in the newspaper who would um, spell as um, Shankar, I mean, most likely. So um, these kinds of things are, are really interesting. These kinds of um, elocutionaries, uh, these kinds of vernacular elocutionaries, they, they percolate uh, into the thinking and, and they get enmeshed into the kind of, um, musical um, identities that these restaurants were carrying and, and helping negotiate uh, the, the, the spectrum uh, between Bengaliness and, and a wider pan-Indian identity. Uh, now here, mm, yeah, so, uh, as I said, um, I was referring to um, softness, but uh, not as uh, in, a, in an empirical sense, but applying that concept in a kind of affective and, and emotional, emotional sense. So, um, I mean, having um, 
having scarred through um, newspapers after newspapers, both um, Bangla and uh, and English and and beyond, uh, I've been also looking into some uh, Urdu newspapers. Uh, though I'm not able to read Nastalik, but I've been taking the help of some of my friends and as well as uh, um, and as well as um, Mandarin. I'm, 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 as a side note, there's a community newspaper which was published uh, uh, by the Camden County Council, uh, which used to publish. Uh, like Bangla as well as Mandarin articles. And one of my friends uh, back from our, our master's days at the International Hall, I mean, she's helping me uh, reading some of these uh, articles, but that's a, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, so um, having looked into all of these, um, it can be uh, said, um, Indian restaurant music came to be perceived as soft um, in the background. And, and this was possibly a transcultural phenomenon, not only just uh, localized to uh, Britain. Um, and here um, I've, I've got numerous um, uh, pieces of historical, uh, historical evidence. Uh, on your left, you see um, the Romna Tonduri Indian restaurant and Romna obviously would refer to the, the locality in the neighbor, neighborhood, the district in, in Dhaka. Um, um, and it says, uh, and it promises a romantic evening, um, soft Indian tra traditional Indian music, um, discreet and efficient way to service. So here I'm stressing on the soft. So um, the soft word is, uh, I found it a lot actually. And, and thus I'm able to scoop out uh, a narrative out of it. Um, I found other other things as well. Um, I, I'm reading them out. Um, well, another would be um, uh, a feature that I found uh, on the I read on the Kensington Post, uh, Modhubon, uh, which was located in Pembridge Road, W11, London, which which said said the advertisement feature uh, said. Um, Indian music plays in the background. Uh, oh, sorry, it, it was not a not an advertisement feature, but it was um, kind of a of a review of the of the restaurant. Yeah, I've I've got it. I've got these kind of scans uh, from the from the British Library. So it is an article uh, written by a review written by Ian Francis of the Kensington Post, and it says, uh, and he he says, uh, Modhubon is the former not. Oh, sorry, um, I'm read from the beginning. Um, Indian cuisine is either one thing or the other, good or bad. Rarely do you find an in-between. Modhubon is the former, not just in terms of the food, but because eating here is an event. Indian music plays in the background. Um, the service is so good that the waiters are attentive beyond the call of duty and the clientele isn't made up of Lager swillers stuffing the faces to soak up alcoholic excesses. Right, flurry, flurry, uh, flourish over there. Um, and then he follows it up with uh, having uh, Indian music isn't as important as the food, uh, but I've eaten in Indian restaurants where the sound of slushy music from the likes of Cliff Richard was enough to kill your appetite. So <laughs> it's quite, quite, quite strong words over there. Um, I mean, many other examples. I'm, I'm citing only a couple or more. Um, the light of uh, Bengal restaurant now, again, again find the scan. Uh, yeah. It, and it was located, I don't know if it still is, I've ne never visited Aberdeen uh, in Scotland. So the Bowles Express, uh, it said the 1984 uh, Aberdeen Evening Express, that had an advertisement feature where um, it said they were vouching an intimate, friendly atmosphere has been created with candlelit tables and again, once again, soft Indian music playing in the in the background. Now, very interestingly, um, this is the same restaurant uh, where the where the once heartthrob of the Calcutta cabaret scene. Um, um, Aroti Das Shefali. Um, she actually visited um, uh, Aberdeen, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, read from another another source. It says um, 
when a Beng West Bengal dance troupe paid a visit to Aberdeen recently, it was not surprising that they should decide to find an Indian restaurant when looking for good food. What surprised the proprietor of the restaurant, what did surprise the proprietor of that restaurant was that the famous dancer Aroti sought him out to tell him that the food was at least as good, if not better than she had sampled in Calcutta. And I, I could verify that this was this Aruti Dash because um, uh, I mean, there's mention of this in a, in a biography. Um, uh, yeah, Shondhara Ter Shefali. Um, I'm not translating this. Uh, yeah, um, published by, by Anondo. Um, um, and further, and I would argue that this is just not the, the Bengali restaurant owners um, kind of confirming to a soft version of Indian music that would play in the, in the background and, and kind of um, append and kind of um, conform to certain notions of, um, of Indian sounds uh, and kind of reek of sophistication and, and elitism. Uh, but it was also restaurants across the, across the community like the Gujarati owned Ashna Indian restaurant um, which advertised, advertised that they, they offered a soft background Indian music. And this was uh, in the 1990, 2nd uh, August uh, uh, issue of the Middlesex Chronicle. Uh, further would be, and my last example here, I mean, actually they're, they're numerous. Um, it would be the Bilash Tonduri restaurant, again, located in Newcastle, a five minute train ride from Durham. Um, it says, um, yeah, I'm reading out this again. Okay, and again, this is not an advertisement feature. I mean, excuse me for that. This is again a review, a restaurant review uh, published in the Eating Out Choices column by Phil Penfold. Um, Penfold uh, and it says, um, and I'm reading out that extract. Um, Uh, we were recommended to try the Bilash out after friends, uh, the Bilash out after friends, uh, try the Bilash out after friends had told us that they had been very impressed by the standard and quality of the food. And since a report like that is always worth following up, we nipped in on a Wednesday night to sample what was on offer. Uh, we were the only two people in the place, apart from the waiter and his chum. And the music in the background was pretty grim. It alternated between two tapes, one of 60s hits, the other Indian music of a particularly wailing variety. So now here, I'm automatically, I can't help but link this to um, Yusuf Mia's um, description of uh, his customers uh, asking why would he, uh, why, why was he wailing, what was wrong with him? So, um, and here I, the hinge is, uh, probably those tapes were not uh, music, which would be of the likes of, of Ravi Shankar or Uri Dimeni and all these, all these kinds of people out uh, glowing in the public stage. So this would be kind of uh, music, which were coming out of the informal economies of, uh, of Brick Lane, music economies of Brick Lane uh, or Brick Lane centered informal music economies. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I think um, these kinds of, um, reviews, they kind of um, help us understand the expectation of these kinds of uh, English clientele um, uh, and, and what they were expecting in terms of a, of a sonic canvas, in terms of a sonic experience. Uh, so far, um, these um, generalized Indian, Indian restaurants were, were concerned. Now, in contrast, uh, I will read another, another another book, actually a novel. And uh, you can see on to your right, uh, the an illustration of the Nirala restaurant. And of course, I think Amadullah Ji will be able to relate to the Nirala restaurant if I'm uh, not totally uh, incorrect. Uh, um, and now it's, it's shut down. So, and it's an illustration by, uh, by uh, Rafikun uh, Nabi in, um, Mr. Akhtar's, I'll just check the name. I, I just got it a couple of days back, so I've not yet got the name correct. Yeah, Rafi Kunnobi. Um, 
in Emma Rakhtar uh, Mukul's uh, novel, uh, London Chakumia. And, and first I'll read this in, in Bangla because otherwise it will drain out the, the rush as we say, in, uh, and drain out the, the, the joy. So I'll read in Bangla and then try to um, um, kind of translate. Um, ब्रिक लेने फुटपाथ धरे एगिए जेते ही पेलम बांगल् लेखा निराला रेस्टुरेंटे सैनबोर्ड भरे ढुकते ही जमजमाट अवस्था आमागो ढाकार राय सहेब बजारे आल इसलम और इसलमिया रेस्टुरेंटर कारबार बसार खाली सीट पर्त नहीं परोटा हालुआ कबाबकारी और बिरियानी और भूना गोस्तर देदार अर्डर हो सबाई राजा उजिर गप्प झाड़े एक कणाय उच्च ग्रामे भाटियाली भावइया गान चल साधे लाऊ बनाइल मोरे बैरागी और डाइल पाक कर रे खासा मरीच दिया मन हल्लेश हाटर मजे दाड़ी काउंटारे अनेक कष्टे जे जिज्ञेस कर लम कब्बाद मिया इस तिरे नीचे बस एंड गोज ऑन सो नल आल ट्रांसलेट सो इट सेज वॉकिंग अलॉंग दुटपाथ अफ ब्रिकलिन I saw this signboard of the Nirala restaurant, as you can see in the illustration, um, written in, in Bangla. And as soon as I entered, it was um, very crowded and it was a very buzz. Uh, I mean, vibrant atmosphere. Um, so in terms of of uh, sonic scapes, very very vibrant. Many lots of activities, lots of din uh, happening. Um, and he says, "Amagurai, yeah." And he says. Um, it's almost like very reminiscent of um rai sahib bazar in dhaka the restaurants fest specifically al islam and islamia and not a single seat was um, available and coming uh, further so he he mentions the names of uh, dishes like porota halwa kebab kari uh, and biryani of course and bhuna gosht and others were flying off the shelves and people were gossiping and one corner so now this this word is important for me uchchok grame which means in high volume bhatiyali bhavaiya gaan cholche in in high volume in high decibel all these bhatiyali uh, songs songs of the rivers in in were were, were playing uh, at full blast songs like shadhel lau banai lo moi ragi and ore dail pak koro and all these kinds of very famous songs um so um now i'll relate this to a recent conversation i had with two elders uh, of the community like two or three days back uh, and they didn't want themselves to be to be put on record so i'll i'll just and they didn't even want themselves to be named uh, so i'll i'll respect that so what they said that um nirala restaurant was very homely and it was really very it it, it customer base was people from the community who would work in the in the re- nearby naz cinema in bricklane or, or nearby uh, um leather factories or uh, all these kinds of uh, business shops video shops so people not exactly um who would visit the uh, bilash tondu restaurant or uh, even farooq ahmed's uh, bengal berties so Here I'm trying to say this um, historical um, softness that I can see in rest Indian restaurant music uh, that that doesn't need to be confirmed to, and people can actually let loose and um, kind of listen to um, songs that they would more relate. I mean, those are closer to their identity. So um, these are very different spaces, and and coming back to Pierre Bourdieu's uh, uh, habitus. Uh, so this is, I think, a Uh, pertinent um device to to understand um this in a historical uh, historical sense as well i mean of course pierre bourdieu um did work um in paris and and he worked on the arrondissement uh, different arrondissements um conforming to different kind of sonic expectations and musical expectations uh, which were representative of the class right so um yeah uh, that's that's uh my uh, hypothesis I and mean, of course and it's more than a hypothesis because i i have i'm being able to support it with lots of um 
oral as well as um, uh, print uh, print sources. So now uh, I think this would be my last. Uh, yeah, my I'm coming towards the end. Uh, so uh, and by and when the restaurant trade was proliferating uh, in the largely uh, steadily in the 1960s, the uh, the Bengali and Bangladeshi or slash Bangladeshi uh, restaurants. I mean, they were coming up because it was uh, it was in a crucial juncture. It was at the same time when uh, the the Shadhinata Andolan had had started, and its it, its repercussions were also felt across uh, the borders, even in Britain, even in in England and and elsewhere, all across Europe. So on to the right, on to the left. Sorry, you see this. Um, advertisement uh, which was uh, published on the um, on the Deshe Duck newspaper uh, local uh, local London based Bangla newspaper so it was run by uh, it's it's the Ganges it was run by a senior member of the community Tasadduk Ahmed and there you can see the, the Bangla uh, heading reads, Bangali Atitto o Burthona Shorbojon Nibidito, Tar Porichai Pabin. So he's actually uh, trying to advertise a kind of Bengali um, hospitality. So here it becomes different. So now there's a shift. And I think these are the seeds of of the rise and the emergence of uh, of separate Bangladeshi or Bengali restaurants and not just a kind of um, generic Indian restaurant, Indian cuisine. So um, in the middle, you see this uh, Urdu Hindi trilingual advertisement, the Dhaka Lahore Kebab House. And it was in the same time as, uh, yeah, there was massive dissent um, against the East Pakistani regime. and. There, I mean, I shouldn't make flesh out a narr narrative or try to read too much into, but you see, uh, there's no mention of uh, Bangla. It's, it's actually trying to uh, probably uh, appeal to a large customer customer base and, and all that. But yeah, I mean, that, that's, that is not very important here. But to the, uh, to the right, you see uh, this um, picture from, and, and I'm sorry for the quality. I mean, it's not a very well-preserved picture. And it was uh, published in the Time Out magazine of, uh, of Abdus Salik. Um, now the late Abdus Salik, who unfortunately passed away last year in Whitechapel um, of COVID. So he had this um, Salik's restaurant. Uh, and this is a photo from uh, 1986, where he set up a um, stage specifically for performances. And yes, uh, and that uh, that feature the Salik's restaurant. It specifically mentions of instruments um, which are of Bengali um, identity and 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 music that was um, specifically Bengali and not not Indian. So this is a separate trend, and I would say this was the beginning of uh, beginning of of the creation of a separate um, restaurant genre and 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 thus probably it was the start of the of challenging a kind of um notion of rest indian restaurant music being soft and and all of that and and probably it was by by that time most of the bengali uh, restaurant owners they were done with um kind of keeping on um appealing to a kind of customer base and and they were trying to um yeah, get get uh, their citizenship asserted um, through through their musicalities um, and sounding out. Um, and by the way, as a as a side note, uh, this Ganges restaurant, which was located in Soho and where Chinatown is, um, they also used to um, organize a couple of meetings, uh, musical meetings, uh, and they would raise funds for the for the seventy one movement. So that's also quite important. Um, yeah, I've looked into other Bengali newspapers uh, based out of Britain, um, at least 10 of them and counting. So this says obviously um, Shohid Sriti uh, Amor Hok, which means um, I mean, 
very broadly loosely humble homage to the martyrs or uh, may the memories of the of these martyrs remain immortal so um it's not like that these uh, bengali restaurants as i as i was showing you uh here they were not uh, kind of um appealing to any kind of a pan indian uh, or orientalist notions of uh, uh, notions uh it's it's not i mean it can't be generalized there there are exceptions but i mean having looked into all these newspapers i mean it is a rarity of course i mean these tropes um the the sitar um, and this there's not really a proper sitar in the sense but uh they they're rare instead we find advertisements of um and one advertisement that i found very interesting was that of uh um uh, chingli mia i mean of, of course who got his name chingli mia because he was trading in in prawns chingris so all these kinds of distributors wholesalers who were supplying to the restaurants because all these bengali newspapers at that time 1960s 70s they didn't have a really wide readership so um they didn't really need to advertise uh, advertise this with the with the bengali diaspora uh, and so yeah i think that that's a kind of um result a uh, kind of um out i mean conclusion that i can get from that now um i mentioned uh, the rolling stones um had also joined the beatles towards bringing kind of indian sounds and here this is the ex boss of the uh, the ex manager of the of the band the rolling smith uh, Ro- rolling stones and um now this is uh, probably uh, dry humor at its best and this is trying to um uh, this is a kind of a um caricature which says like they're trying to um create an album which would be representative of the indian music sound that all including bangladeshi including bengali uh, including pan indian restaurant owners were trying to um create in order to uh, appeal to customers and trying uh, in a way occluding their own um identities so here tracks like um so it says um uh, sorry it says tracks like oh, what my what's my sorry yeah tracks like um the korma chameleon or tears on my pillow dhansak in the city so it really it is teasing the kind of um notions of um orientalist notions that 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 was Uh, that that had um developed in in britain so it was a matter of um balancing um balancing money making um ambitions and at the same time also um lending a sound that was uh, probably more true to uh, to their own listening practices and that's why i have i've kept the title of my presentation carrying to tune so in a sense carrying um two tunes all these chefs and the back doors and the in the in the back ends actually literally carrying to the tunes because most of them uh, would really listen to music they would need the music to get going and also in a sense carrying to tunes in a sense carrying to these um to the tunes of these expectations of the of the uh, customer base so yeah i think uh, that's brings that brings to the to an end of my presentation and yeah i look forward to uh look forward to engaging in and further um question and answers thank you mm. thank you vidit yeah um yeah we got lots of time for uh questions uh people have been fairly shy about writing anything so why don't we just uh, see who's prepared to unmute and ask directly okay well <laughs> while that's happening um i i just like to ask you um i mean it seems to me that um there's quite an important um yes uh, uh, mushumi wants to ask something so i'll keep my question go ahead mushumi you un- unmute yourself and ask directly you could have asked first okay go ahead 
Why don't you you ask first, then I'll ask after you. Okay. Okay. Fine. Well, um, I was uh, the the. the there are a number of things I, I wanted to ask. I mean, one was the um, the link uh, between um, the kind of change that you um, uh, point to uh, from a generic style to a more um, Bengali-centered style, uh, particularly the role that, that Abdul Salik played. And you pointed to the 1971, you know, independence struggle and, and um, uh, of course, Abdul Salik played an important role as a community activist during the 1980s. So it seems there's quite an important political shift, if you like, uh, from a, a kind of trying to appeal, uh, use Orientalism to appeal to a, a predominantly white audience clientele. And then during the 70s, 80s, as the Bengali community becomes more established, more self-confident, more politically active, there's a um, a change reflected in the kind of music display. So it's really, I just wonder whether you think that that's true or not. Yeah, that's that's largely true. But um, I mean, it, these these processes and and happenings, they they always keep on happening at the same time. So these are parallel developments. So even now, and uh, in Brooklyn, if you take a stroll, you'll, you'll obviously listen to keep listening to Bollywood music. And and here, I I want to stress that. Uh, I do not want to mean uh, that Bengali restaurant owners did not like uh, Bollywood music or mm -hmm. did not like or did not actually connect to uh, this kind of um, pan-Indian music or really mm -hmm. the soft mu instrumental music. I mean, of course they like, but uh, what I'm trying to stress here is this is not the music that most of them would listen to while while they were with their friends or at home yeah. or at or these Gharoa shows or these uh, homely gatherings. So most people uh, wouldn't listen to them. Um, I mean, of course, from a, from a younger generation, um, they wouldn't listen. And here, uh, I didn't get like space here to include this, but um, but when Moshmidis um, was chatting with um, two restaurant, uh, I mean, one restaurateur. Elal and Kaya in the in the British Library recording. Um, there's a clear difference in the listening preferences uh, between them, and one being younger listens to a wider range of of music, mm -hmm. and the British Bengaliness is more acute uh, with respect to the young uh, to the older uh, person uh, who would relate more to kind of um, notions of. Um, of of just of just Bengali just Bengali music so so these are very very complex um, happenings at the same time and it is really difficult to flesh out a generic um, uh, discourse but that's what I don't want to do I mean I, I think history is about further uh, problematizing things and and not not really simplifying yeah I agree okay um, I, I've got another question but I'll let um, uh, Mashumi go ahead please. So thank you, Buddhadito, for a very interesting talk. So I, it's more uh, a few observations. And uh, so um, one is, I was wondering that when you're thinking of the sound, uh, when you're talking about Peter Cusack's work and you're thinking about soundscapes, so there's a particular soundscape uh, which is around the restaurants when there are people who, when they come from, when they, I think their first post is actually outside the restaurant before they can actually get their job inside the restaurant. They, uh, many of them are posted outside. So very young people, they stand outside and they call out and there is a call that there's a sound to that call or into the restaurant. So if you are passing that street, so, from each of the restaurants, you're going to hear that sound, and there's um, there's a there's a constant competition that goes on. You know, who gets to uh, get more more customers, more people. So uh, that's one of the things. One of the sounds I thought um, it is definitely connected with uh, with the with the sound of the restaurant, with the soundscape of of Bengali restaurants. But Bengali restaurants, so the, the point is again of Bengali restaurants and Bengali 
uh, just as you talk about Indian food, similarly, it's about what food is being, just as you talk about soft, um, soft music, Indian music, similarly, what food is served here? So uh, what is this food? So there is generally, you know, I think there is, a, if you look at the menu, there's a, there's a fixed kind of menu that is offered, which is not so Bengali even, you know? So it's, it is, there is, the, the, it's a curated kind of a menu, which is, which caters to, so it is really carrying to a kind of taste. So, and an, and an expectation, this is something that I was thinking. And um, within, within the space of uh, say, even Brick Lane, even now, so when you talk about you know, the, the more homely space that uh, is there in Mukul's book, so um, that he's talking about. So it's there even now in Brick Lane. So there are some restaurants which cater more to the local people. And I think it's true of even the Chinese restaurants uh, in Leicester Square. So there are some where only the local people go. And so local people who work in, in, in and around Brick Lane will come to Gram Bangla. And there you're, you're going to get Bhatta. So you or, will not or, get- Or Ponchokhana, I'm sorry to interrupt. Ponchokhana, where we went, I think in 2018. Yeah, yeah where you treated me with-, with uh, Yeah, 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 with exactly. Paski Bhatta, yes, I remember. So, um, uh, so that's the kind of, um, um, there, the kind of food that is there on offer is something that your, your, the customers won't even know to order, won't even, they have no access to that food. So there is, it's, it's also, um, it's, it's a very local food. It's a very local kind of taste, which, um, and, uh, it it that that is where I think a country within a country, a nation within a nation, a state within a state, it kind of survives. And this is also not even just Bengali means something very vast and so fragmented, so divided. This is very typically of a kind of Bengali food that we are talking about here. So I, I think the, those regional variations within food. And within sound, those are things to uh, which uh, I just thought about. And finally, I was thinking when you say like maybe Ravi Shankar was written by a Bengali, but if some a Bengali had written, then would probably write Robi as well. So would probably write R O B I as well. So it might have been a typo as well. So it might not have been a no, no, it, it was not a typo because uh, they would write Shankar the same spelling uh, up, um, issue after issue. So, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. so yeah. this was not a typo. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> then why not Roby? <laughs> why not Arubi? I mean, I, I'm, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm not trying to say that this is it, but <laughs> these are one of the hints I'm saying a historian can take. I mean, obviously not say that this was happening. So not, not causally, but, but just as a, as a hint. And, but uh, Georgie has been asking something. Mushmi would the people outside restaurant be present in the same way outside Brick Lane or Drummond Street <coughs> across the UK, much more silent on the street. I don't think it would be the same. It's a very Brick Lane thing, I think, uh, Georgie. I, I would assume, but I really don't know. I couldn't say for, with any certainty. But I do also think that it is a very Brick Lane soundscape where um, this kind of falling the call, a very typical call um, that we hear. This is what. You no, know, talking about Brahman Street, I mean, I see uh, both um, Shudip Toda and Vigran Kota here, especially Shudip Toda. I mean, we often used to um, frequent uh, Ravi Kebab in, in Brahman Street from the from the International Hall, just jaunt, jaunt down to uh, Ravi Kebab because of the uh, so called awful quality of food at cost. So, um, uh, and yeah, it was completely different. Drummond Street soundscape is completely, completely different from uh, Brick Lane. Uh, not only because of um, the Bengali uh, presence, I mean, there is Bengali presence, obviously, and there, there are every, all, all presences, I mean, there are presences of presence of every community in, in every place in London. So that's not a factor, but it is uh, intrinsically different. So you are very correct. I 
Ado? Just a, just a quick one. You know, this uh, touting, as people say, hmm. uh, um, that that wasn't always the case. I don't remember exactly when he started, maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago. No, probably over 15 years ago. I don't really know, but it wasn't always the case. Hmm. And uh, people did try to stop it, right? And a lot of people are embarrassed by uh, by this, you know. It's, they think that it destroys the pleasant and nice uh, atmosphere of Brickland. It's like uh, begging, you know, people to come and and trying to outdo one another in terms of uh, offers. Uh, this is what happens abroad, you know, when you go to many countries. Uh, so not uh, so it's a, it's a it's a new thing, but I don't remember exactly how 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 new. I have got a question from uh, Shukla Kulkarni. Mm -hmm. um, she's asking, do you look at the restaurants outside London, like the Balti Triangle in Birmingham? So mm -hmm. far, I mean, uh, thanks to the pandemic, I haven't been able to do kind of field work and archival work in Birmingham, but, but I'm planning it um, soon, to be honest. So I'll look and thanks for the suggestion. I'll, I'll uh, look at Balti Triangle and, and see what, I mean, uh, just to say, I mean, this, I didn't plan this as kind of any um, serious uh, line of inquiry for the PhD, but now at this stage, it might as well be. So it is turning out to be really um, how can I say, interesting. So yeah, I will, I will keep an eye uh, on it. I was gonna ask um, about uh, Vera Swami, uh, you know, and what, what uh, I was thinking really about the kind of um, kind of up uh, up market West End um, restaurants, you know, um, and of course uh, those families goes back a long way. So I just wondered if, if there's an important kind of class difference in terms of you know uh, what the restaurateurs want to provide people and what they think the people coming to the restaurant actually. Uh, want you know um, they, they might think that they don't want this kind of oriental style background music um, I've always been interested in in why Vivaldi's Four Seasons is played in virtually every restaurant um, you know how, uh, how that became part of the soundscape but that's probably another uh, question uh, thanks for this uh, John uh, but before I take it do I also uh, get to Georgie and uh, Shudikta's question yeah. So what do you concur? What do you think? So yeah. So Georgie, for, uh, please. Yeah, Georgie, and then uh, Sudipto. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, a really, really fascinating talk. Um, I became really interested. I mean, it was all it was all great, but I was just thinking about the music um, in terms of the copyright and the um, the difficulties that the re restaurateurs have had um, around that. Um, with some of the, uh, my own work that I've been doing about border force raids on rest Bengali, particularly Bangladeshi restaurants being so targeted um, in, in London and, uh, and across the country. And that kind of really, really resonated with, with me. And I was just wondering if you might have said it and maybe I didn't pick it up, but whether you felt that Bangladeshi restaurants felt particularly targeted in this respect, or you had any any evidence um, either way, and whether um, other eth so-called ethnic enclave restaurants had experienced similar difficulties. But so far, with the with the restaurateurs I've uh, talked with, um, like in in a personal capacity, uh, basically this was uh, this has been an overlooked issue. So since this is a matter of three, four hundred pounds per annum. So no one really cared. Um, I've just been able to trace two cases. And, and I, I was actually talking with, with Farouk Shaib regarding this uh, while he was driving back to uh, East London from Enfield. And he was saying he approached all his fellow colleagues uh, uh, within the association um, and no one uh, actually lent, lent an ear. So, um, yeah, this has been an overlook because it's a matter of uh, like 100, 400 pounds maybe per year. So no one would really care. But yeah, at the same time, there were other people as well at his prodding who who wrote back and they got the, they, they got a waiver. So, uh, but that's that's a development after maybe how many, um, 
20, uh, more than more than 20, 25 years, 86. So yeah, 10, yeah, 24 years. So uh, a lot might have conspired, uh, yeah, within. So yeah, I, I will be looking at the court case, uh, what happened uh, if, I, if I get a copy. And, and other other uh, related stuff to to get a sense of what happened there. So, yeah. yeah. Can I come in a little bit on this question, yeah. please? Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay. So uh, it's just that I think this whole idea of this copyright thing, you know, it just simply doesn't seem to work within in the same way. It's a very cultural thing as well. So with the in in Bangladesh, this whole notion of you know, that you cannot play somebody's music and you have to pay some mm. money for it. This mm. whole idea seems not to work at all because I have my own experience as a singer and mm. as somebody who has traveled so much across Bangladesh for so many mm. years. This is something that is, um, that it's a very different cultural notion as well. I think copyright becomes a very different kind of the people have different ideas about you know about proprietorship and ownership mm -hmm. and sharing and mm -hmm. uh, and i think this is also it it leads to that those questions as well yeah yeah very true um and if i may add john uh, so i've been looking into this informal music economy and and Ahmadullah Ji might be able to shed some uh insight from his personal experiences uh so all these uh, shops, uh, music and video shops uh, lined across Brooklyn, once lined across Brooklyn, mm -hmm. like Shongita, Glamour International, Milfa, all these kind of places, mm -hmm. um, Nas. Um, so they would actually um, uh, source all these kinds of local recordings. So people, uh -huh. musicians from Bangladesh, when they would visit uh, mm -hmm. uh, UK, uh, so they would be recorded or even in, in Bangladesh. Uh, so they would have all these uh, huge gatherings are shorts and they would record stuff and mm. and fly it back uh, and they were there would be and I was talking with uh, the once proprietor of uh, um, Shongita now what is uh, salad box uh, and he runs the place as well so with with uh, Shaun Urmia and he was saying that they would do all kinds of things so it would be labeled packaged and um, so they were they were proper proper kind of products coming out of the informal economy. And I'm, I'm trying to look into that as well. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know to what extent I'll be able to excavate these sounds because most of them, they have been dumped into uh, garbage bins after the coming <laughs> of age of the digital thing. I mean, in fact, uh, I was able to excavate some um, um, playlists, some CDs, and these are things which are not available on YouTube. So these are some of these local CDs. So. I, I'm yet to digitize okay. them, which I will. Yeah. And once uh, I'll, I'll let you know, and yeah, so what, okay. what comes out of it. So, yeah, okay. I mean, obviously this is contrasting with um, things like, what can I, yeah, uh, it's, it's quite contrasting uh, with uh, CDs like, yeah, pirated copies of uh, this or, uh, or Air Rahman uh, double pack CD or Talat Mahmood's Ghazals. So, yeah. Mm, great. Okay, so that's the data. If you could uh, unmute yourself, ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yep. Yep. you are. Okay, so uh, two uh, questions actually. First of all, uh, uh, thank, you, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. And also, uh, I was particularly interested in the uh, advertisements of the Bengali curry houses you showed from the uh, 1960s and 70s. I'm curious to know whether you could also find out the menu cards of any of these uh, curry houses and whether those menu cards featured any of the so-called uh, Laskar dishes. What I mean by Laskar dishes is that you know, dishes which are not traditional Bengali dishes, which would, would not be cooked in, uh, you know, the villages of Eastern Bengal or even Western Bengal, but which were mainly popular in ships mm -hmm. among uh, Indian uh, Laskars. Uh, I am reminded of uh, Gualunga Steamer Kari, which Mustawa Ali writes about, uh, and you know, any, any such dishes. Did you find out any such dishes which 
uh, you know, the uh, which is a Laskar dish more than a uh, Bengali dish, mm-hmm. Eastern Bengali or Western Bengali. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. the first question. Uh, so do, I, do I take this or do I uh, like? Yes, uh, yes, yes, as you please, as you. Please. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll get this first. Um, so I mean. i think uh, all these kind of ephemera they are located at the museum of london museum of london archives uh, i mean tower hamlets has a few but not many very scanty so um yeah this is it uh, i mean i'll have to check but uh, it is unlikely it would have i mean obviously you'll have to look into these um, kind of uh, makeshift restaurants and and coffee houses cafes located along uh, lime house along that area and georgie here would be where uh, probably would be able to shed a light because um she she is an expert in that area especially i mean uh, limehouse and all these docklands so uh yeah it it might be um, there some lying somewhere so yeah so yeah yeah next question please uh, because uh, i think uh, you should uh, karma chameleon i i don't know whether that is a word play on karma chameleon but I, anyway uh these are you know uh these are names which are being created uh, to 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 suit a western audience i suppose uh but uh, or to cater to investor or western audience but i think i was just uh, curious whether you find anything which in any laskar dishes at such in, in these items because uh, as we know a, a substantial section of the silhouette diaspora in london especially in london in 1940s 50s were like, Up to the 1940s, it was worse than the last year. So I was just curious about that. And the second thing, I, this might sound, and this might actually be a very uninformed question, but I'm just—it's more of a curiosity. Uh, and it relates to the politics behind the usage of the word "soft." Uh, is it in any way linked to uh, you know the centuries-old? Uh, allegations of effeminacy leveled against bengali since the days of uh, thomas babington macaulay and uh, using the word soft is it uh, is it an is it an attempt on behalf of bengalis to create their own distinct identity uh, as something markedly different from let's say uh, the punjabi diaspora and you know the the other indian people who were settled in britain at the time uh yeah this is a uh, quite a good question so i i know i don't i wouldn't agree in that sense uh, obviously all uh, the pan indian um, diaspora I mean, from the subcontinent to be honest they were uh, they were doing this uh, they were they were kind of happy with this kind of uh, i think this is what i what i can get the can gauge at this moment uh, with this kind of soft uh, notion and and they probably didn't have a great agency in that I mean, even uh, momentous meetings like that of uh, Purnodash Bowl's meeting with uh, Bob Dylan, uh, uh, and even they were occluded, uh, and they they didn't get any. I mean, proper cur- currency compared to what the meeting of uh, Ravi Shankar and uh, George Harrison got. So I think that was one of the very uh, landmark moments uh, in that, and. and to be honest uh, ravi shankar did not like this at all i mean he would also i mean he would also confide with my uh, guru ajay chakraborty that he didn't like this at all he would actually hate it um, but um, uh, so but he couldn't do anything i mean he couldn't stem the stem the this this outburst and that's why he mentioned it uh, the global um, sitar explosion i mean he didn't mean it in very uh, positive sense um and coming to um i'm not sure if i lost your question uh oh yeah coming to effeminacy so um i have found um uh, records of sailors actually one record at the museum uh, museum of london archives where a sailor was uh, was hanged uh, in the dockyards in somewhere in the 1870s for uh, uh, i mean for for being alleged of sodomy and um and this is a really hush hush uh, matter because most of them would be uh, islam and and it, it's it's a quite a big hush hush i mean even now i mean no matter then so uh, there were all these kind of people called ghatus and ghatugan as you call as the dhaka district uh, gazetteer mentions uh, so these were all kinds of effeminate and uh we don't know their their 
sexuality yet, but they were kind of effeminate people um, who were who were actually taken to the ships along with these sailors, with the koilawalas, the stokemen, and all of that, just to uh, just to act as a source of entertainment uh, uh, with them. Uh, and 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 I, I I was looking at the library of the of the Royal Asiatic Society here. I forgot the name of the of the text. Um, it, it has got a foreword by uh, Ram Mohan Roy. I, I'll probably send you a copy. I've taken it on my on my uh, Zippy device. Uh, so there it mentions a word term called uh, Baiz. So similarly, we have uh, Baijis. It says Baiz. And they were all kind of, uh, I mean, the gender was male, but they were pretty effeminate and they would be taken to all kind of marriage parties and occasions. And they were the quite raucous and unlike the... Uh, Unlike the Notch girls, uh, they were not as expensive, so they they offered performances for much less. So effeminacy is definitely there, but I don't think these are like the same events, so parallel developments. But yeah, thank you for the question, Felicia. So uh, Naomi has been waiting very patiently, so please unmute yourself, Naomi, and ask your question. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, a really interesting. Um... Uh, talk and presentation there. Can can you hear me? Yes. Sure. Yeah, um, my my question is um, in regards to I was just thinking about what, one of the interesting aspects of the presentation was the the newspaper articles and the the advertising and um, that music list um, the Kurma Chameleon that that really stuck out because. I'm, I, I was born in the 1970s. I saw the restaurant trade from very close up. Um, my father was a restaurateur. And um, I was into, um, you know, I, I was into English music and I was also into um, Bengali music as well, or Indian music, if you will. Um, and I was just interested in, in that, that subtle, well, not so subtle racism that was kind of reflected in the, in the newspaper articles and in, in that list of songs and, and the other things that you'd shown us. I do you, I kind of feel like we are still in the same status quo that newspapers would still get away with that kind of blatant racism. Um, and I, I, I imagine that, you know, newspapers like the Daily Mail, um, the Sun would actually I, I kind of believe that they still are doing it, maybe not to the Indian restaurant trade or the Bangladeshi restaurant trade, but, you know, things like migrants and immigrants, um, it's an ongoing thing. Do you think, my question here is, do you think that we, when I say we, I, I of Bangladeshi origin, do you think we can make a space here? Um, because I kind of feel like, the Indian restaurant trade is still struggling to make space. And I go back to what Georgie was saying about the um, about the raids. Um, there is, you know, there is a tax on all sides. So can we make a space, do you think? Yeah, I mean, here I'm, I was having a chat with one of my friends who, who actually knows the Chinatown area quite well, um, Alice Hill. So he, she was what she was. I mean, discussing when we keep discussing about especially the restaurant trade because um, she's been looking into this uh, Chinatown area for quite a bit now. And um, what she was suggesting, like the Bengali restaurant trade, can definitely uh, carve out a niche if uh, and only if uh, Bengalis and Bangladeshis are I mean, people from West Bengal. They actually start cooking their recipes instead of <laughs> cooking uh, so-called um, chicken korma or a jalfrezi or a or a dhansak. I mean, dhansak has absolutely absolutely got no relation with, with Bengal. It's it's from from Western India. So <laughs> so uh, these are not really uh, dishes hailing from the from the Bengal from from geographical Bengal. And probably Shudipta that would remember we would have similar debates in in at the International Hall about uh, the, the vastness of Bengali cuisine compared to other, and we would, we would, we would vouch for that um, compared to other parts. I mean, arguably, I mean, we are biased, but compared to other parts of the subcontinent. And coming to racism, uh, if you want to have a good dose of racism, if you want to get hit by a good dose of racism and uh, get yourself flustered 
completely. You must read the Punch, the Punch magazine, which is at the British Library. So, <laughs> if you if you if you read, so you'll, it's guaranteed that you'll get flustered. So, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I it that's interesting because um I I do believe I agree with you that I think Bangladeshi restaurants do lack authenticity. Um, and without that authenticity, uh, I I I kind of. Sympath I'm sympathetic with the owners of the restaurants because I think they are still pandering to their customers' demands. Um, and until those tastes are introduced and eventually changed, I think that tide of not fitting in is not going to change. So I, I, I think I do agree with you on that. But um, yeah, thank you. Excellent presentation. I, I, very interesting. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Mandela? Just a quick one. Um... Related to the last bit that Naomi <laughs> was talking about, you know, um, there has been a debate, you know, in in, in the Bangladesh community why uh, the restaurants are called Indian. Uh, when I was uh, kind of militant, you know, uh, studying at university, I went and confronted some restaurant. There's one I went in one restaurant that's uh, between Hampstead and Golders Green. And I went and asked them, why don't you, why do you call it Indian? Uh, but then in a few months later, I did see they added Bangladeshi, you know, but then they took it off again after a few months. Basically, I think, you know, the, this restaurant, the Bangladeshis uh, entered in big numbers to serve Indian food. Indian food that was kind of popular or white British people were familiar with. That's the taste that they were, you know, trying to serve. Um, so, but, but there are a few people who tried, you know, like the Mirage Cafe that I mentioned earlier on, in the 70s, they used to serve a lot of Bangladeshi stuff that you couldn't get in, in other places, like Rimas, you know, the way that we eat and, and other stuff, right? Uh, so they would only attract Bangladeshi, you know, you wouldn't get English people because they're not familiar with. Um, if you want to introduce, um, you know, the regional food that we have, to a wider audience, then you have to try and see the trends and, and use, you know, this get trendy people to come up with some creative stuff, right? Presentation and, and so on. But I think overall, you know, the Indian uh, chicken madras and all those kind of thing, um, relatively speaking, I think they're slightly on the decline because there are so much more offers uh, in terms of cuisine in this country and new things are, Kind of emerging but that taste will still be there you know a large number of british people even people from the Bangladeshi community they also like this you know tandoori kebabs and you know chicken tikka masala and, and things like that uh, so i think uh, it should be clear right that bangladeshis were cooking indian food not Bangladeshi food it's like you know if Bangladeshi some Bangladeshi open up an italian restaurant you are not going to go and ask them why are you serving italian why not Bangladeshi? But they are there to serve Italian restaurant. But then, you know, there is a challenge. I mean, we love our food. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, depends on our people, you know, who knows the food trade to try and develop and promote, you know, the kind of food that we eat. So here, here, I just want to make it clear. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, suggest that the food that we get right now is not authentic. So again, if we say that, we again get back to the revert to the same problem. Uh, try, trying to create a sort of notion of authenticity. I mean, of course, this is authentic in its own way that like this is, it, it is British British Indian cuisine. So it, it is now a sort of own cuisine in its own right. So I don't want to say it's not authentic, but it's definitely not uh, what you get uh, back in, in Bangladesh, back in, let's say, Mulubi Bazar or, or Jagannathpur or, or Golab Kranj in Silet or uh, other areas like Bikrampur or yeah, in Dhaka. So. Just one thing, uh, did you um, did you look at the wallpapers? You know, the in the sixties and seventies. You know, <laughs> did you think uh, about that as well, and how the music they played kind of blended in or or contributed? You know. Yeah, well, it's a very very pertinent question, Amadulaji. I mean, I'm I've, I'm interested in mu music iconography, and and now late I mean, off late last two years, two three years, um, I mean, taken to art history, so. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, music iconography, and that's where that interest um, gets alight because you'll see obviously uh, music icons like instruments or figurines or figures playing stuff. So 
that obviously is is in my in my ambit, but um, I mean I couldn't include that in this presentation due to I mean uh, due to lack of time. I mean it would. It's, it's just it's just the softness that you experience, you know, uh, with that. I also think you know the music, uh, the sitar and you know, the soft music. Uh, this also came to cater for white British taste, you know, what they were expecting from Indian mm -hmm. restaurant. They would have been advised, you know, by white advisors or customers and, and so on. I mean, I'm just speculating. I have no idea, right? but it just seemed that how it must have started and continued because uh, they responded as well. Oh, nice music, a really nice atmosphere and so on. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was going to ask, um... Uh, whether you are linking this up to wider uh, research on soundscapes, you know, and going back to my original question about the endless playing of the Four Seasons by Vivaldi in a lot of restaurants, and um, I, 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 are you extending it or are you going to uh, limit it to? I mean, if I'm uh, to be honest, I wouldn't want to branch out too much into um, sound studies territory, but essentially keep it to music, but. Uh, yeah, no, not actually um, leave it all together because this is a project on its own, uh, mm -hmm. like sounding and sounding out, sounding in, sounding out. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's probably got postdoctoral. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, a postdoctoral uh, scope. So I mean, we, we'll see where it leads to. But for the PhD, I think that would be a bit too too broad. So. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm just trying to outline in, but I'm trying to keep music as the main main focus here. No, I, I was thinking of uh, use of different uh, um, other forms of music in other types of restaurant. You know, um, beyond this this particular ethnic niche. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's definitely uh, there in my uh, plan. Uh, but yeah, I, mean, I haven't branched out yet, so. I'll, mm. I'll look into, I mean, food, food anthropology is something I haven't uh, looked very closely, but uh, I will, I mean, of, of course, Yuhan Patia, the food anthropologist who was at SOAS, now he's retired. So he was writing, he has written about the Kolapata in restaurant in, in Whitechapel. So, uh -huh. so uh, it's a 2014 article, I, I can email you the, uh -huh. the, the article. So yeah. here, here, I mean, uh, he was, he, he has written that, um, Kolapata is a, is a particular restaurant who wouldn't play any any other music other than Bangladeshi music. I mean, coming out mm -hmm. from the Bangladeshi mainstream media on television. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a marker of, uh, of um, sticking to kind of Bangladeshi uh, identity. Mm -hmm. so. Would it be all right if I said something else? Of course. Got yeah, time, it, it's uh, it's that even within this Bangladeshi restaurant or Bangladeshi, there are the, there are these competitions between sileti and non sileti. So I know that in Dhaka biryani, they they were insistent that they are not from silet. They mm. said that you know we are not from silet. Mm. So I think there are also these these uh, these other differences. And Kolapata had this very interesting experience where. I had to go to meet somebody. And then um, as I was standing outside waiting for this person and my song was playing inside. And uh, so they knew that I was there. So they immediately started playing my song. So um, that, that was my experience. But one of the things when we say Indian restaurant, what is, uh, what is again, what is Indian food? What is Indian food? I mean, what is, where is Bengal in it? There is no Bengal. First and of I all, think First of all, what is India or, or what, what, who are Indians? So, <laughs> and, what is, yeah. and, and what is food? So <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and then, the the hybrid. <laughs> God, yeah. But um, with, uh, no, but I've now I lost it because you said uh, what, what is food? What, what kind of uh, Indian food did uh, British officials eat in India when they were running the country? What did they eat? You tell us. Well, when they were served in there, you know, by servants cooked for them, uh, the you know business people, officials, 
and British Raj people. What kind of food food that the the Indian? Yeah, they probably they they did they eat so much Indian food. They actually ate their own food. I think they trained their uh, servants to make their their kind of food. But they also had Indian food, so there a a taste did develop among them, you know, of Indian Indian. So that would again, I think, probably be not the, um, more the kind of uh, a Mughal kind of food or something like that. Probably it would probably be that, and not our uh, shukto and chaturi and dalna and all of all of that. I don't think they were eating that at all. Yeah. In no. fact, with with Bengal Bengali restaurants, Bengal food. Even within in Calcutta, if you think of it, when when did the Bengali restaurants start um, coming up? We didn't have Bengali food really selling. It's only now that it's becoming more and more popular. That uh, you know the the Bengali. So the question of actually popularizing Bengali food and making it kind of you know bringing a big uh, clientele to the restaurants. It's only been happening now. It's, I, I mean, I would think in the last 10 years that this we've been seeing Bengali restaurants. Earlier, there used to be one or two in Kolkata. There weren't that many even. You know, we, people would go to for Punjabi food, South Indian food, or um, for Chinese food in Calcutta. But hardly anybody went to Bengali restaurants. We Now we have many. Okay, we've got two more questions, and we've got seven minutes. So, uh, near me. Uh, I, I kind of feel like, uh, going on from what Moshimi was saying, I, I, I don't know the statistics, but of all the restaurants across the UK, would I be right in thinking that statistically we're looking at more than 70% would actually be run by Bangladeshis? Would that be right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess in, in, in those terms, um, it also goes back to what Georgie was saying, that, that Bangladeshi restaurant trade is being targeted when it, when it comes to raids and, you know, immigration raids. Um, but it's I, when, when more than 70% is run by Bangladeshis, it, it's almost inevitable that it will feel as if, it, as if the Bangladeshi community is being targeted. Um, but... Going back to the, the question of authenticity, um, I, John, it was really interesting what you were saying about um, the, the current food that we serve in Indian restaurants is almost a fusion because it's yeah. a fusion of food that has come from history. It's come yeah. from what people tasted in the Indian subcontinent and they brought that back. They, they wanted that when they came back to Britain after their posting had finished in the Indian subcontinent. And I guess in some ways that that's what the first restaurants were catering for. Mm -hmm. And and up until today, they are still pandering to the needs and demands of of whatever their clientele is, whatever their um, customers, whatever background their customers come from. But in terms of authenticity, I, I was I'm kind of thinking how difficult it would be. You would need a tremendous amount of unity to be able to get the majority of Indian restaurants or Bangladeshi restaurants to say, yep, from now on, we're going to do authentic foods only mm. based on, you know, the district that we come from, whether mm. it's from Dhaka, whether it's from Borishal, mm. whether it's from Select. And again, mm. I would imagine that more than 50% would be from Select. Um, mm. and, but that's, you know, that I'm, I'm kind of running off numbers from my own experiences, which, which aren't mm. much. Um, but yeah, it's kind of difficult to actually get authenticity into the system and to change the way that we, because we do very often complain about, well, Bangladeshi restaurants aren't really Bangladeshi. Um, but that's just an observation, not so much a question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, may, I, may I have a, like a few, like couple of seconds response, John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, another thing I, I did not mention I should actually is uh, most of these people who were cooking uh, in these so-called Indian restaurants, they were men and most of them mm. did not know cooking to be honest mm. so that's also one of the mm. reasons like yeah, that yeah. one of the reasons lending to the quality of you now present british asian food so yeah. called um, and trust or, or, yeah. or yeah so yeah. they were not very good chefs to be honest <laughs> okay mas hi uh, i'm sorry i turned up late to this um talk because I, I finished work a little bit late but it's very very interesting listen to everyone um, just to touch on like Naomi's point and like, um, you know, 
I, I think to, to, to trace curry in Britain, obviously, you've got to look at its colonial history and then just from mm. the term itself. It, it, I mean, we, there's no term for curry in the subcontinent. So entirely from its inception, it was a, um, I, would, I would argue, somewhat of a, almost like a English cuisine. And to see it in recipe books, etc. I mean, they were so, they were very divorced from actual, you know, subcontinental authentic foods. And, and to say, like, there's a particular, I mean, what they were chasing, especially during um, the time of D Sheikh Dean Mohammed's, uh, you know, business venture, when the, and especially like how the elitists were trying to chase authentic Indians. I mean, to say there's an authentic way to cook a curry is almost like saying there's one way to pluck a chicken. Um, <laughs> But in seeing that metamorphosis of curry into now, what I found very strikingly interesting is curry was in, initially eaten by elitists and aristocrats and upper class people. You saw after World War II, this completely changed and it became a very working class dish. And first, these, especially the Bengalis, and even in the 30s, it was the Lashkars, it was poor sailors that would come and open these restaurants, not for... I mean, depending on whom, it was mainly Indians that would open it for um, a, a white customer base. But the Lashkars and the Bengalis, that these would be open for cafes for them to eat and dine in for themselves. And there's obviously a lost history there because you can't see how what exactly was cooked. There's no documentation of it. Um, but I find that interesting because many of these places served as communal hubs uh, for Bengali Lashkars. Uh, as mutual assistance in the case of deplorable circumstances, because it obviously wasn't very good conditions. Many of these Bengalis are living in when they'd come over here as sailors. But then you see this change because you see Badu brothers come through. And when you had more immigration of Bengalis, etc., the trade was kind of learned of the Badu brothers. And they were the first one to set up um, almost like the godfathers of this new inception of uh, the, you know, British curries, which became, a, you know, a very, the, 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 the most significant cuisine from the 50s onwards. And they were the first ones to open the first Taj Mahal. And then you see all these other chain of restaurants owned by Bangladeshis, obviously before 71, being called Taj Mahal, coming off these very colonialist names. Um, and I think it's interesting when you're looking at curry because it's always been serving the host. It's, it's in the name of a host culture. There's nothing very been authentic about it. And you, you saw in 1995, the Dine Bangladeshi camp. That it's owned mainly by Bangladeshis and, and, and not Indians. But there's nothing authentic, as you touched on, about, about the dish itself. Um, when I've, because I was trying to do a documentary. Uh, I'm aiming to do a documentary on uh, British curry houses and the social history behind them. Uh, and the hardship the restaurateurs face, because we usually focus on the dish itself rather than the actual restaurateurs and how these places serve more in diasporic culture. But um, what... Hello? Hello? Yes. Oh, sorry, I think my mic cut off there. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Master, uh, we've, we've got another question, Master. So uh, while you're sorting yourself out, um, Raganko, will you come in, please? Unmute yourself, yeah? Yeah, sure. First of all, wonderful talk, Uthalito. Thank you for this enlightening uh, lecture. I was, I know that I, you work on the British context and there's a very strong post-colonial and post-colonial resonance to that. But I was wondering about a comparative case study. Uh, this was uh, about New York, the Indian restaurants, uh, the South Asian restaurants in New York. Because what I understand, speaking of the 60s and 70s, New York had a different uh, orientation regarding the countercultural scene and the new age scene, uh, which is very interesting, I think. And then uh, the people making music in New York also goes to these kind of these Indian restaurants. So there, there is also some kind of synergy between the American countercultural scenes happening with the Indian musical scene and also the food culture of New York. I was just wondering, uh, do you also, that that might be also like band touch upon that? 
you need to unmute yourself i think oh sorry yes no thank you mirjan for the for the question uh, yeah uh, vivek bald has uh, worked on the uh, bengali diaspora in uh, across the atlantic so i mean i haven't checked his work in detail but uh, i need to check and and see whether he has looked into all these kind of um trans um oceanic interoceanic rather interoceanic um i mean links so uh yeah and that that is definitely worth something to look at uh, i mean i i recall going to uh, when i was at palermo uh the palermo in, has enjoys a good bangladeshi uh, diasporic presence and yeah these are exactly not uh, like same things i mean they have all these kind of nuances in in identity constructs um and now of course there's a triple migration going on with uh bangladeshis first having settled in italy and then coming yeah. to the uk right now right. I mean, obviously there was a yeah. feature at the bbc on, on part of the bangladesh at 50 and uh, i mean i don't know if you're able to come down to london anytime from amsterdam but uh, i mean if you come uh, now you will see some uh, small cafes around uh, white chapel especially mm-hmm. i can remember one name cafe italia which is a bangladeshi mm-hmm. cafe run by uh, migrants who have been based in in italy and now they're based here so it's a triple migration and they yeah, yeah. very interesting amitola have we run out of time or um if there is interest we can continue forever yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay No, I didn't know whether Mas was wanting to say anything more, but um, otherwise. Hi, sorry, my my mic cut out. Um, no, uh, my I think my my point was just it's been interesting to see how it, curry went from being something associated with upmarketness and mm. eaten by elitist colonials to then being a very working class dish um, that white Britons were very much enjoying. even though we wouldn't really indulge in, in that particular cuisine of, of, of curry it's, it's not authentic and then now you see somewhat i would argue the death of the industry but the only way it's surviving is now going back to the upmarket clientele but it's obviously right. changed it's now people want something authentic yeah. but it's in places like dishroom etc it's still going off this colonial this oriented this backdrop you haven't escaped that yet and i like to think can you escape that in britain or is that in we need we need to interrogate that I'm not saying it's good or bad but mm. that's what it is at the end of the day and when you look at curry it's a complete anglicized dish it is it's a whole thing in itself it's it's it, it, some of these dishes are so divorced from something you find in the subcontinent mm. and I was interviewing a, a chef from Portsmouth uh, for my documentary on it mm. and he said when he got here he didn't even know what a chicken vindaloo was mm. he said what's a, what's a, what the bloody hell is a tandoori of it I've never heard of this. I've never seen it. <laughs> and it's very interesting. And obviously, that's just in regards to the cuisine. Obviously, the music. This is a whole new thing that I, I've been uh, uh, that's been opened up for me from this talk. Um, you know, for the documentary, I'm more focusing on the social history, such as the lush guys have been communal places, the lodging houses upstairs. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting to see that shift. That's all I wanted to add. But I was very long-winded in in saying so, so I do apologize. Okay. that's absolutely fine no thanks for your comments and and could you please send a link to your to your documentary somewhere that would be really yeah, great absolutely it, it's still in its production phase but um i'll i'll take you i've got your email and i'll probably be in touch with some of you somehow um yeah, yeah. please please so, yeah yeah absolutely yeah no problem thank you thank you I, i was just going to ma- mention uh, Sean Carey's recent um, study on the decline of the uh, bengali restaurants um in brick lane and um and i just wonder whether that's simply people moving away you know uh, not necessarily the demise of the so called curry industry but uh, more a kind of diversification following uh, partly bengalis moving out into newham and uh, walton forest and uh, um So I just wondered uh Buddha, whether you thought about that at all. Yeah, I mean I I've thought about that but not given really great I mean further thought but I, what I think is now I mean realities shift so now mm. uh, I mean notion of authenticity has also probably changed and and dishes yeah. like vindaloo and all these they already established dishes I mean much like what we have 
in Hindustani music. I mean, new rugs keep coming and over time they get established and older ones phase out, phase away. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, mean, th- I think it's also a, uh, also the uh, I mean, inevitable, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, process of time. So, yeah, there's some things, I mean, which we can't probably change. So, yeah, change is, ine- change is inevitable. So, yeah, maybe. I, I was also uh, wondering about the role of, of the pint of lager, you know, that uh, seemed to be part of the package. You know, it wasn't just the, the food, it was also washed down uh, for many Brits with um, lager. And of course, Brick Lane um, uh, became more Islamicized, I suppose, that became more and more difficult to do. So um, that's more a kind of uh, footnote, I suppose, to what you're doing. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, now there are various kinds of uh, restaurants here in Brooklyn, but many of them are actually run by people of Bangladeshi origin, though they they would, uh, I mean, though they would appear to be Korean shop, Korean restaurants. Behind the scenes, uh, yeah. Behind the scenes, I mean, the ownership is still the same, and yeah. even uh, people of uh, Bengali people still run these places, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So kind of parallel with the Jewish community before them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I think we're pretty much uh, through. So I'll hand back to uh, Amadou Uh Thank you. Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Is it Buddha Tia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tia for this presentation and John Eid and also for sharing and everybody who participated. I just want to caution people about something, um, you know, uh, about trying to establish authentic Bengali restaurants. Uh, because what I've discovered is that a lot of the food that we eat in Bangladesh, uh, also not very different from uh, food that people eat in other Indian regions. So we won't be able to separate from Indian food, right? Uh, because if you look at Bartha in, in South India, it looks the same as Bangladeshi Bartha, right? And if you look at Sardin Bhaji or Mas Bhaji, everything, it, it, they're not that different. I mean, there will be some uh, differences, but uh, so we Bangladeshis won't be able to separate from India in terms of, you know, Bangladeshi food, because then Tamil people and somebody will come and say, oh, this is our food as well, <clears throat> you know? I think the Indian food that has been established here, it's what uh, the most mentioned is, is uh, probably the most accurate, uh, you know, um, understanding of uh, our sense of what Indian food is in, in, in this country. Uh, 